Welcome back, everyone in YouTube land. This is your tinfoil hat economist coming back to you at the speed of light with episode number 30X on the fable of Singapore. Well, let's get right to it. What is the fable of Singapore? Well, let's lead into it. Not quite right to it. Let's go to it backwards. A couple years back, the government of Singapore, which is the city-state on the very southern tip of the Malay Peninsula, on the rim of the Pacific, near Indonesia and Malaysia, announced it would uh, had a national program to produce 30% of its food, about a third actually, they called it 30 by 30, inside of Singapore boundaries. It's a city-state. They're going to produce 35% of their 30% of their food by 2030 inside uh, through a system of uh, government policies, import protection, and subsidies. And they got a $65 million program going, and they have uh, fascinating things. They're building eight-story, eight-story um, warehouse menu, uh, vegetable manufacturing facilities, aquaponics, hydroponics. They have fish in there, and the effluent from the fish fertilizes the plants, and the plants help clean the water, and it recycles again. Wonderful stuff. And through this uh, government program, they will import sub uh, they will supplant uh, imports. It's called an import substitution program, and bring 30% of food production inside Singapore. Now, why is that interesting? Well. In Western academic circles, macroeconomic circles, Singapore is uh, repeatedly cited as the free market citadel of the entire planet, which is why it has such high living standards. And in fact, they do have high living standards. If you go to Wikipedia and you look at a list of the richest countries in the world by per capita GDP PPP, which means purchasing power parity, Singapore has $105,000, almost $106,000 a year in purchasing power parity, GDP, and the U.S. is way down there at $67,000. Switzerland's doing a little better. Norway is pretty high. That's all their oil money. Ireland, because they have, it's kind of a bogus thing, they have a lot of uh, corporations based there. Qatar is oil. Macau is gambling. Singapore does quite well. Those are all the rich countries. So this, uh, but how does, why is Singapore regarded as a free market economy? Um, I think mostly because that's politically convenient to say that. When you look at Singapore, you find out there's a few oddities for a free market economy. One is all the land in Singapore is owned by the government of Singapore. Okay, all the land government owned. You can lease it, but it's government owned. Two, 80% of the population of Singapore lives in government-built housing. Okay, free markets. Three, the government, through the Monetary Authority of Singapore, manages the exchange rate of the Singapore dollar. And they do this as part of a national policy to run current account or trade surpluses every year. Four, Singapore has a national health insurance program. Private citizens do pay. They make co-payments when they go to doctors. There are private providers, but there's also five public hospitals in Singapore. Some people get most of the services for free. They have a national health insurance system in Singapore. Free markets. Singapore, if I can read my handwriting here, has nationalized industries, such as Singapore Airlines and certain ocean shipping companies owned by the government of Singapore. In fact, Singapore has been so aggressive in building out its uh, resources or economy in terms of infrastructure, the government of Singapore built an entire island to house a petrochemical industry, which they invited to move. It was a national policy to bring petrochemical and petroleum industries to Singapore they built an entire island called Jurong Island. They then took 49% stakes. They provided the capital. After providing the infrastructure, after providing the island, they provided 49% of the capital to build out the petrochemical 
industry and they retain 49% stakes in many of those industries. So the Singapore program to replace 30% of the food that's now being imported or to Singapore with domestic production is not, a lot, not at all unusual for the government and economy of Singapore. Some other interesting tidbits I came across. Uh, here's one description that Singapore has something called the Economic Development Board. They've been very active in soliciting foreign direct investment, which they do by uh, subsidizing uh, factories, infrastructure, training, and so forth in inside Singapore for those people that invest in Singapore. It's described this way in one academic paper, macroeconomic policy in Singapore has largely been directed towards generating high savings and investment through forced savings and budget surpluses to provide the infrastructure, tax incentives, and subsidies to attract foreign direct investment to the republic. Well, that's a little bit different from free markets, isn't it? Uh, another description of Singapore mentioning the Economic Development Board. It's an agency set up with 1961, attract foreign capital, blah, blah, blah. The government has, via its statutory boards and agencies, played key roles in providing good infrastructure, road, electricity, transport, and communication, creating a conducive environment for foreign firms to set up manufacturing and production facilities in Singapore. It goes on to say that the old model of encouraging foreign development has been somewhat replaced by a model of their kind of dicey language, but it looks like a lot of import substitution and innovation is now the current model that Singapore is following. Um, so given all this, why is there this fable about Singapore being a free market? Well, once, or once a year, some organization called the Heritage Foundation releases a study on which governments are the easiest to do business in, and Singapore ranks high. And that's true. You want to open up a factory or business in Singapore, arms are open. It is a pro-business government. It is a pro-business government for domestic industries, industries that are based in Singapore industries that will export from Singapore, industries that will replace imports in Singapore. It will subsidize industry. It will bring trained employees to industry. It will build out the infrastructure for industry. That's a lot different than a, than a laissez-faire, free market, limited government. It is almost a maximum government, which has led to the success of Singapore. Now, I don't recommend this approach for larger nations, such as the U.S. Singapore is a city-state. It's often very hard to distinguish between what a city-state does in terms of city planning and what is national economic policy. In other words, if Dayton, Ohio sets aside some land, calls it an industrial park, builds out some infrastructure, and invites manufacturers in, that is not U.S. national economic policy. In Singapore, it is, because it's a city-state. That's all it is. So it's very hard to distinguish between what is city policy in Singapore and what is national economic policy. It's one and the same. And I don't think in a complicated uh, political system like the U.S., where there's so many special interest groups, that the Singapore model will work. But what I want to point out is it's simply baloney to say that Singapore is an exemplar of free market ideology in action. It is an exemplar of government policy hand in hand with business to create prosperity inside Singapore. So that's your, that's all for today. This is your tinfoil hat economist signing off at the speed of light. I look forward to seeing all of you in the next episode of the tinfoil hat economist. Tally ho.